Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Forward Thinking. We have an amazing guest on today, pretty much a veteran of the B2B tech uh, scene, and he's past EVP of Global Product at Marketo and now CEO of a company called Syncry. Um, so we have Nick Bonfilio. Welcome, Nick. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, so we decided we wanted to have Nick on to talk about an important topic for people and mops. Um, pretty much everyone can kind of take some great nuggets from here because we're going to talk about roadmap and how that's important for teams, especially for those that are working cross-functionally. And we know MOPS is one of them. And so Nick has an amazing background working with product teams and you know now leading a company with different teams and trying to keep them you know on task. And um, a big part of that is having a roadmap. So yeah, just to kick it off, would love for you to dive in on, you know, the importance of a roadmap for product teams, um, but also, you know, for all teams and maybe how you also implement those at Syncre today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. I, I, I think, uh, as we, you know, mentioned or uh, discussed earlier, I mean, to us um, in, in a product organization, it's really you're trying to get to some North Star with your product. What are you trying to build as the end result of what you're trying to get done? And so from that point on, it's like, okay, so that's where we're going. How do we get there in chunks that make sense to get there and what order do these chunks need to happen in? And so it's immensely important for, you know, building the roadmap. The example I, I use here is, you know, you can go to Google and you can ask it for directions, but if you don't know where you're going, it's not going to give you a roadmap. And so the roadmap is really key to how to get to your North Star. So establish your strategy, get your North Star done, determine the chunks uh, that you need to get there, and then place those chunks in the order that you need to get those done. And then, you know, something we do uh, here is, you know, we tend to we tend to like with a particular chunk of our roadmap, we build a bunch of OKRs around that. Mm. One last thing on roadmaps, you know, we, we use roadmaps in every organization here, starting at the highest level all the way down to every organization inside of Syncre. And even as small as we are, there's still a marketing, there's still a success team, there's still a product team, there's still uh, engineering, there's still, you know, um, and sales, et cetera, and every one of those teams literally has a rolling 12 month uh, roll uh, roadmap. And I'm uh, sorry, yeah, 12 month roadmap. And they also, in every quarter that we're currently in, they have a set of OKRs that they're going to use to achieve that set at that part of the roadmap. So it's critical for me as a product person. That's just how I run the company. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's important to note because a lot of the times we, um, we hear from most people, oh, well, you know, we're pretty small. Like, why do we need a roadmap? Or, you know, I, I think at this point, you know, it's just me. So why do I need to establish a roadmap? And I think you make a great point that, you know, no matter how big the department is, you're all part of, you know, an organization that has some of the same goals and maybe that like one North star. And so having that roadmap not only keeps you on task and working on the things that really provide value, um, but really can make sure that you're you're working on projects that you know the whole company um, kind of supports or, or gets everyone to that north star. Yeah, I'd love and I'd love to break down you know a couple of things or a few things that you said there. So you obviously you started with the importance of having the north star to help kind of make it obvious what should be on on the roadmap. Can you give us some insight into how you come about? How do you how do you define your north star? Like. What what is the some of the things you look at to come up with the North Star? Or, and do you have multiple North Stars or are you just kind of focusing on one thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So at the business level, the North Stars for us are, you know, depending on what stage of company you are, it could be a revenue target. It could be number of logos attained. It could be whatever your North Star or, or you're trying to be the thing in a particular category. How do we become that thing in a particular category? What are the steps to get there? And so that becomes the highest level. And so then the mark, you know, if, if, if that's your North Star for your business, what is marketing's role and what is products' role and what is everyone's role in getting to that, that end game? What do I need to do as a marketer to get the company to this North Star goal? And then that becomes your North Star goal in a way as well, because everything you're doing should be to shore up that thesis. And if your thesis is wrong, you, you adjust and people pivot. And we, micro pivoting is something that people talk about a lot now. But the reality is, is that, you know, you, it, you, you have to have these North Stars at the highest level. And then every organization is going to have, how do I shore up that North Star? What do I yeah. need to do to make this company do what it's trying to get done? And then that should, that should definitely give you the insights to go build a proper roadmap. 
Yeah, that's that's really interesting because last week we had Daryl Alfonso who runs marketing ops at AWS at Amazon. And he mentioned um, kind of in a different context, but it's basically the same thing where Amazon's North Star is customer obsession. How do they make everything better for the customer? And he said that that makes things so easy for him to prioritize because he's like, well, anything that isn't helping that, you know, off the roadmap and everything that is, is on the roadmap. So Mm -hmm. it's interesting, like, yeah, it's very, very, very similar thinking. And if, and we always talk about this a lot as well, um, they're kind of getting down to the kind of the the nitty gritty of MOPS, like marketing ops is able to impact revenue, even though a lot of people in MOPS think that they're somewhat separated from that because they're working in the tools and they're, they're not really thinking of themselves as a, as a marketer or a business person. They're more like kind of thinking, okay, well, I'll, I'll treat this tool, I'll make this change, but everything you do in MOPS is going to hopefully impact revenue or it should be. And a lot of companies, obviously their North Star is to generate revenue. So if you're not, if you're not thinking about your, your role in MOPS as a revenue generating or supporting role, then you're not really thinking about it properly. It, I couldn't agree more. If you have people in marketing that don't think their job is to generate revenue, I mean, they're in the wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely the most critical thing. I mean, they're the beginning of the revenue ramp is the yeah. only way to think. <laughs> yeah. I think that a part of that for MOPS people is, is, is the, there's a certain, you know, part of MOPS people that forget they're in marketing, I think. Yeah. It's like, you, but if you're in MOPS, you're still in marketing and, and like you still need, obviously you, but you, you need to still have that marketing hat and not just be only thinking of the technical stuff. You need to be also thinking about the business outcome. Um, and the, the other thing I wanted to dive into with you where, so once you have that North Star, you know, for a lot of companies, it's pretty obvious. It's probably revenue. It's probably a good place to start, right? Um, once you then have, you know, a list, you, so you're managing a product or you're managing, you know, your MOPS team and your resources of a MOPS team. And you're trying to develop that roadmap and there's just a lot of, you know, there's a lot of work you can do, right? Mm -hmm. There's just like too many things and not enough resources to do it. How do you go about then prioritizing, even if there are like too many things that all still attach to revenue, obviously like get rid of the things that aren't attached to the North Star first, but how do you then still go on um, to prioritize your work and then build out those OKRs that you mentioned for each team? So, so the way you have a North star, you have a roadmap within each quarter, you've got big rocks. I mean, that's, let's talk about product first and then we'll go into the, so once you have your big rocks for the quarter and by big rocks, I mean like, what are the three big things I'm trying to get done this quarter and how do they shore up that North star? Then within those big rocks, you're going to have OKRs to achieve those big rocks. And so building that level of detail out and how do I measure myself? that I'm achieving this goal is important. And, and you'll know that these are the things I need to get done. It automatically builds your priority from building the OKRs. And then how do you defend those priorities when mm-hmm. something new comes up is like, you know, this is where, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but you have to figure out a way to communicate that there's X amount of capacity in my team and I can only achieve X amount of things. And we're at capacity and we can talk, we can have a discussion about, you know, changing, we can have a discussion about removing or adding, but, you know, those could be things that you do in a later quarter. And what we try to do here at Syncre, and we did at Marketo too, was once we set a quarter, you can't touch that quarter, we're, we're executing. And the biggest thing that happens is people want to, want to impact the quarter that you're in. And mm-hmm. so you have to get to a mental mindset where you say like, you know, we're, we're wrote on everything we're doing this quarter. Can't take anything all sound, but let's talk about the rest of the roadmap from, from last quarter on. Then you can have a dialogue about how to slot in the priority in future things you haven't even started on yet. If that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting that you said that you guys have a 12 month roadmap. Cause I think another thing that we always hear is how far like forward should my roadmap be? And I think some people think, oh, I don't know if I can even think that far ahead or, but as like kind of what you mentioned, you're going to have a slew of things. And if you're only picking three big rocks per quarter, that doesn't leave much room. You could probably plan out a whole year just within your planning session at the beginning of the year. So I think having that 12 month and, and you know, things change, like you said, you're going to pivot. You, you may change some of those things later on, 
but still thinking that far ahead, I think is a new mindset, especially for marketing and mops where it feels a bit more like you're just tackling what's going on at that moment, really thinking, you know, look further than that. Yeah. And I'd love to dig into something you said around um, with the OKRs, like how are you going to measure whether you've mm. achieved the the OKR for that goal? I think that's a really hard thing sometimes for most people to do because yeah. they're like it, they're trying to do something, and they they sometimes you sometimes forget what the business outcome is meant to be, and mm. the business outcome is probably the measurable thing. Like if you're creating a campaign ops process, and that's going to you know, increase and scale the amount of campaigns you do, you kind of forget, well, then I could easily measure, like, have our, have we been able to deliver more campaigns this month or something like that? And has that de- driven more revenue? But it's, t- it's tying that MOPS work to a metric, which then still ties to the North Star. That's kind of where everything links together. That's correct. That's correct. And as we just had, did a webinar on the future of KPIs. And, you know, the reason we started Syncery was because we saw, you know, Web Marketo, we made it towards easy to generate a ton of data. And the reality is, is that ton of data, if it's not accurate, um, if it's not constantly cleansed, if it's not incongruent with the rest of the business and you have siloed or shadow data or shadow metrics, you, you want to immediately get away from that. And so we saw that happening at, at Marketo and, and through, you know, today where the way we've connected our systems and the way we think about our data is, is an interconnection kind of thing. Mm. The reality is all these systems have to work interoperably. And so interoperation is what we're trying to bring to the table. It's very different than the stuff that came before because to have good metrics, you have to have clean data. And mm-hmm. then the other thing that I really like, Charlie and Chrissy, that that we don't do enough of is, is ratio metrics. I mean, I talked a little bit about this in my webinar, but this ability to say there's an input and output to a metric that is combining two teams together. So one of the ways I think of it is SDR, you know, appointments generated to number of ops closed and things like that. So, so ASP is another one, like early on in the size that we are today, understanding your close rate ASP from your open pipeline ASP and understanding where you fit there is, is a key indicator to whether your sales team can forecast correctly or things like that. And so, so you have to start doing some of these early KPIs um, that are ratio based so that you understand like, oh, well, they're 80% effective in forecasting ASP ratio, things like that, right? So, and there's mm-hmm. a bunch of them. There's how many how many new new leads that I create, how many yeah. ops that I create from those leads, and and how yeah. many of those ops close. So these ratio metrics go throughout the business. Anyway, to answer your question, it's it's in, important to have the right data in order to create the right metrics. And I think metrics, Charlie, happen and Chrissy happen in three different buckets. There's the business metrics we all know about: AR, MRR, CAC. Et cetera, mm-hmm. LTV, the retention ratios, things like that. There's the next level down, which is really the operating metrics. And this is where I think MOPS and other people play, which is like how many bugs, escalations, um, how many, you know, exactly leads that I generate, how many ops did I create, how many meetings did I generate for sales, how many of those meetings turned into demos, you know, whatever your discovery process and demo process is for your business. But that's the next layer down. Then there's departmental metrics. There's the what do I need to make sure my department, and I call these you know, um, things like the ones that we talked about are these departmental metrics of how am I doing against trying to generate the leads that I'm trying to get, the number of meetings I'm trying to get. And so being able to do that. So business operating and departmental metrics are important because when you do OKRs, the measurement you may have for a particular OKR could be short-lived. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to exist forever. And so mm-hmm. you don't want metrics that always exist for It's like, how am I gonna measure this for this OKR? Okay, I'm done with this OK, this ob- objective. So I don't need this metric anymore. Get rid of metrics that you don't need anymore is another key aspect to building an effective measurement system. Yeah, I loved how you broke down the metrics into those three areas there. That was really awesome. And to, one other thing you mentioned as well before that was around releases. And I think yeah. one of the things that um, a concept, and we can dive more into product thinking and concepts that we can apply to MOPS, but I think one of them is release cycles and mm-hmm. in in marketing operations you you're delivering things like kind of every day you're making tweaks every day and and it's going live every day it's not like you're kind of building everything up and then you're releasing it to customers you know every quarter or anything but you can i still believe you can you can have that mindset mm-hmm. where you said you know once you've locked down a quarter you're not going to do anything else in that quarter so marketing operations once you have locked down your plan for that quarter Anything else additional to that, unless it's a real fire drill, 
has to be pushed to the next quarter and that's your release i've even had some clients like name their releases mm-hmm. even though it's not really a release but it personifies your work so you can say i'm working on this thing it's got a name it's got all of the the different features and yes you're dripping them out during the month and quarter but it then it's it, it's that easier it's an easier conversation to have with the the other cross-functional teams that you're that are trying to still push their priorities on you yeah that, that's spot on Charlie. i mean I, I i we you know the good news is is that in engineering side and product side we have gone almost everyone now does you know weekly sprints and they release weekly and obviously yeah. we have daily patches or things like that. That's just the way the business is now. I'm so happy that we're finally getting to a point to where like, you know, Syncery releases every week. There's some new, something new in the platform and there's something we're releasing that's shoring up the roadmap for the product along the way for mm-hmm. that quarter. And that's exactly, so that's another measurement is did we achieve the, you know, the, the building blocks to get to this major rock that we're trying to get done in the product for this quarter. And I just happen to be blessed with a team that not only understands these concepts, but, um, you know, they're high execution as most, as most marketing ops teams are, they're super high execution, high energy. And, I, and I'm just so blessed to be here at Syncry with a team that can get an amazing amount of work done, especially with, you know, Varsha and engineering. She's just a huge powerhouse for us. And, um, you know, our marketing team's just now being built up now. But the point is, is that the execution has to be there. Um, but you have to get in the cadence, which is what you're saying, Charlie, that makes sense for whatever it is that you're doing. But the cadence is important, having the cadence, having people mm-hmm. know what the cadence is, et cetera. Totally. Yeah. And it's sometimes hard to go from not having that cadence to having that cadence. But you, and because the teams were like, oh, wait a sec. Like I, I used to be able to slack you and, and get you to do something the next day. But that's where you need to institute it, be disciplined. And, you know, maybe in a few quarters, people will understand. But you've got to start somewhere. I think you'd be shocked. I, I think once you have your roadmaps and you have your OKRs and you're presenting that, people are going to look at that and go like, oh, wow, this person has their act together. Yeah, How, you know, that's a good point. Totally. Yeah. And so once you people see that you have your act together, the, their willingness to push on you is going to be, you know, based on the fact that you already have a plan, right? So totally. if you don't have a plan, people keep pushing stuff on you because they don't know what you're doing. And so they're they're constantly pushing new things. And so you have to get to where you can communicate here's my plan, here's where I'm at, here's where we're going, and, mm-hmm. and and show execution towards that. And then you'll get respect in the execution side. And that respect lets you garner the ability to forecast other things and people listen to you. Then. So. Yeah, and we I have talked about this in a past podcast, but you often find that people try to micromanage or drive your roadmap when they don't trust you or they don't right. see a plan, right? If people don't see a plan that's scary, they need to create a plan for you in order for... Mm-hmm them to feel better right. that they they know you're going to hit the goal too because we're all a team right we're all one team so if demand gen or the rest of marketing see, doesn't see that plan for marketing ops they're just going to take whatever their goal is or whatever their initiatives are whatever whatever that might be and it might be different across the board so now you have like five different people trying to drive your roadmap so so you need to take the initiative to really you know set that yourself totally spot on it's just like that linkedin post that i replied to you uh, I mean, poor mops people of, that don't have plans. I mean, actually, we saw this at the early days of Marketo and, and uh, you know, where everybody who had an idea would wag the, you know, the mops tail. And it's like, uh, yeah, for in the absence of a plan, people will create one for you, whether you like it or not, right? <laughs> totally, yeah. And especially, so speaking about Marketo, um, so I'd love to dive into the difference between the, when you were managing the roadmap there or a kind of early days up until when you left and mm-hmm. the differences there but then also comparing that to the roadmap at Syncery you know early stage startup um, and then because I think there's a lot of parallels there between a marketing ops person owning a roadmap for a small startup mm-hmm. versus you know mid-size versus I mean definitely enterprise so love to dive into your experience there and the differences that you've noticed. Yeah that's a great question uh, so in the early days of a company, both Marketo and Syncry, where we are today, roadmaps are driven like Phil Fernandez and John drove a lot of the roadmap in early Marketo days. And just like Nilesh and I are driving the roadmap in early days of Syncry. And, you know, when you get past a certain stage um, at Marketo, like, at, you know, contrast that to the end of the Marketo phase where, you know, it got so big and it got so much that we had to build a product council to actually control the roadmap and make sure that everyone understood what was on the roadmap. And I think it's okay for even larger marketing teams 
to build a marketing council and, mm-hmm. and actually get cross-functional buy-in into their roadmap and plans. It's the same thing we did at Marketo with the product roadmaps. And so this product council was executives from every area of the company that would get together and would inject, you know, any, look, I'm going, we might be thinking of going after this particular vertical in early 2000. Okay, how do we get ready for that? How's the product need to get ready for that? But then we would push it back as well in this product mm-hmm. council. It's like, what do you guys need to do to get your teams ready for this new vertical? What's more, you know, so everybody's going like, oh, okay. So then we're starting to build almost like company-wide planning as a result mm-hmm. of this product council uh, that we would lead. And Cheryl was, you know, would also run the release, you know, cadence meeting where she would make sure marketing and everybody was on the same page. So people in one level down were in this other meeting that was about executing the delivery. It almost felt like, at one point, Charlie almost felt like we were running the company as the product team in order to get yeah. things out. And that's the contrast, you know, from small, you know, Nilesh and I, Phil and John, um, when it gets bigger, you need to get buy-in and the roadmaps and planning is all about getting buy-in, earning trust that you're delivering on your roadmap, et cetera. How did you deal with disputes on the council? Was there, did you have like a demographic process where you would vote on the council or was it just kind of very fluid and you kind of just figured it out in lots of conversations? Yeah, it, it's, it's negotiation, right? And, uh, and I, I think this leads to one of the other topics that I want to mention is that in, in marketing ops, they probably haven't been too used to negotiating a, a, a thing. Um, and so, but when you have roadmaps and you have planning, you have to learn how to negotiate. You cannot become passive aggressive or defensive in any kind of conversation. So it's, so having that negotiation skill is something I would encourage every MOPS person or every marketing person to go get as well, because your ability to say, yes, I wanna do this for you, but I'm gonna do it here, is the different thing than saying, nope, can't do it, you know, and walking mm-hmm. away or, or it's just like, right. yeah, yeah, I'll do it, but you never actually intended to do it and doing that passive aggressive stuff, that's crazy. Like that drives me, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so being able to say, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, yes, uh, but here's when, or this doesn't even make sense for our North Star. There's no way we're ever going to do this. I just want you to know that. That's how we ran into the product council too. Charles, like, hey, where is this in our North Star? What we're trying to get to and our goals that we have for the company. And of course, you know, Phil Fernandez also attended these product councils. So he had obviously the biggest veto power of anybody. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so what would happen is like, if he didn't feel it was executing on his North Star for the business, because Phil was very much driving that, um, he would be the person saying, yeah, we're not going to do that right now. We're just, mm-hmm. this is just not the right time to be thinking about this. Let's talk about this next year or something else. Right. And let's yeah. stay focused on this North star goal for this. Yeah. It's always good to find a bad cop. We say, I mean, it's hard when you have a, your team of one, but being able to always point back to another person be like, well, they're the final say. And, uh, you know, if you're in management, that's a great thing to tell the people on your team who are maybe struggling with negotiating or prioritizing like use use you as like the bad cop because you know that'll be easier for them and I think it mops especially because we tend to be a bit introverted we uh, you know we people pleasers. people pleasers people that work hard and so we're always thinking about others instead of ourselves first um, and so trying to make that balance. And I think part of that is just working on those soft skills and really understanding who those people are, like what are the goals that they have? What are the things that are driving these requests so that you know how to frame your conversation with them and know when maybe something actually is truly important and you need to maybe prioritize it more. Yeah, the so- negotiation point you made, honestly, I feel like I've, I haven't heard anyone articulate it like that before, but it makes so much sense. You know, yeah. it's, it's just, it, all, it almost feels like one of the most important skills that you need as a marketing ops person. Mm-hmm. Cause we talk a lot about all this stuff that we've been talking about, like people pushing their priorities on you, having to juggle a lot of things. And it seems like one of the best ways to get out of that is to be able to negotiate your way out of that. <laughs> right. So like, and it's probably, I probably, I've never heard of, you know, and maybe I've missed it, but I haven't heard of anyone in MOPS saying, oh, they just bought a sales book on how to negotiate, you know, like, but that probably could be a really good use of time. Yeah, but sure, there's a lot of articles out there to teach product managers how to, you know, there's no okay. more bigger numbers than an engineering team and product team, right? So, so <laughs> we struggle with it as well, but there's lots of articles uh, out there for teaching product managers how to negotiate for roadmaps. And okay. I, I was just reading a few of them this morning to just brush up on some of that. And I think there's, 
definitely content in there that could apply to most people because I see the same similarities of like, oh, we need this new feature. Oh, I need this new campaign. Or we need, you know, if they're very similar as I was reading through it and they could learn how to negotiate those, but you cannot negotiate without having a plan, without having a roadmap. Because negotiation is about like, I need to stop doing something in, in the next three quarters. Which one of these things do we stop doing? That's the negotiation. That's, mm-hmm. that's, not, that's, you're not saying no. You're saying yes, but when makes sense for us, right? And here's what we need what we would be affecting as a result of saying yes. Are you guys all with me? (laughs) Totally. Yeah, and you have to come from a a strong position where you, 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 they really can tell, like you know what you're talking about, right? Because if you're like, and this is something that we've mentioned before, sometimes you'll speak to people in mops and I I don't think it's their fault. It's because kind of they, they haven't got there yet. They're working on it, but that you might ask them, what did you do last quarter? And it's really hard for them to articulate what they actually did because there's, mm-hmm. there's been very scattered, kind of spread very thin. And they, you didn't really work on big projects, kind of like you mentioned, like your three big rocks, right? Like, it sounds like everyone at Syncery, if you said, what did you work on last quarter? They were just like, okay, these big rocks. Obviously, there's probably lots of other things, but it's like the big rocks. Um, and if you don't have those big projects that you are working on that are on your roadmap that are tied to the North Star, it's very hard to kind of remember what you did because you just dealt with you know, Slack messages and just doing little things here and there. So if you're coming from that point, that's a really hard point to negotiate from, right? Because right. you're not in a strong position because you, they, they don't trust, like Chrissy mentioned, they don't trust mm-hmm. that you, you've really done the work to do the best work. So they're always going to think that their project is the best thing for you to do. Yep, yep, um, totally agree. So I know we're kind of um, coming up on, on time a little bit. Um, were you about to... Yeah, I mean, I, I think just one thing I just wanted to point out, because I just, I really like this conversation. I yeah, think more and more, I'm seeing just parallels between MOPS and like a product team and engineering. And I think this is also a good um, lesson for anyone who like leads a marketing ops team or is hiring for a leader in marketing ops that I think sometimes you're so focused on hiring a technical person and someone who like knows how to use the tools or knows how to connect the system together. And I think that is something that you want to look for to staff your team. But there's also this need for someone who understands all of that, but also has these skills of negotiating, project planning, creating the roadmap. And if you look at a product team and engineering, they're two, they're two separate teams, but they're working so closely with each other. And one's kind of telling the other what to do. And so our, I mean, our, we talk about this a lot, but our goal is hopefully that marketing ops will get the, you know, even more budget to build out those teams, but really like they can, there's these kind of creatives or the more like project planners, more forward thinking marketing ops people who know it needs to be done, knows how to staff the right people and can do all the stuff we're talking about. And then the people who are more of the engineer technologist types who can actually like use the systems really well. And so um, it, and in order to have a great marketing ops function, I feel like you need all of that. Yeah, I, I agree. The same way in engineering, the the best engineering managers are probably as good, if not better than the product managers uh, that are probably driving the product roadmap, if you, if you know what I mean. So they know how to negotiate and execute as well on the stuff. And they also know what's important, what's not on the engineering side. So it's so there has to be, you know, I know this is about MOS, but I think marketing in general mm-hmm. needs to have a view on how do I run marketing and even you know chrissy you, you, you know this better than anyone it, it just sometimes feel like it's just you know utter chaos that's happening and you don't know why it's happening or what mm-hmm. the, what why we're doing some of these things and then you know there's always somebody that's injecting a new project i mean I, I, that just happens i mean it's it's more controlled in product side I, i'll give you that the product is more controlled than mm-hmm. than what happens in marketing but like hey we need to do this new event need a new webinar need, need the, i mean they just mm-hmm. come out of the and, and it's, if, if you you need a system to be able to know when when to slot it and where to slot it uh, so that it shores up your, your your North Star. I mean, that's, and, and that has to come from all areas of marketing because I've even seen, you know, CEOs inject into marketing, yeah. CMOs at projects, um, you're doing events and you have an event planner and event coordinator that's trying to do event stuff that you need to support as well. It's just, where's all this stuff fit together in one plan it needs to happen. Totally, yeah, and I think where one thing that we've mentioned before that is there's like the campaign execution side, which is handling all of like the new event, the new webinar side, and all of that, and then there's the strategic mops side, which is you know 
building the the structure, the organization, building the whole foundation for marketing to operate. Um, and they're both separate and you need to have time for both. So there's the roadmap is probably more going to be around the the mop strategic side and then but you still need to manage the campaign X. And but a lot of teams end up, especially in the marketing ops teams of, of one, they end up doing like 95% campaign X and then it's like a little bit trying to keep the systems together. Yeah. Um, and just dealing with issues and bugs as they come up. Um, and that's where you you need to try and speak to your boss, your boss's boss, your boss, like someone up the, up the train again, and negotiate, negotiate to try and <laughs> un, try and get un, that under control and be able to carve out more of your time to develop the roadmap. And if you and and it's hard because obviously there's a lot of leaders of marketing who don't understand marketing operations too but very well, but the marketing ops still reports to them. And that's where you could potentially, you know, that's where maybe revenue ops comes in and could potentially solve that problem. But obviously it could end up creating other problems. But but yeah, no, this uh, this conversation has been been really great because I feel like we talk about this stuff a lot, but, you know, going to the master who's been doing this for <laughs> such a long time and build, building products from the ground up and giving Amazing a lot of, products, yeah, yeah. yeah, products that marketing ops people use, right? So it's such a good, good, per- thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, yeah, quick, quick last minute. Um, where can people learn more about you and your team and Syncery? And what's yeah. the best way they can stay in touch with you guys? We do two things. If you want to know more about the company, it's uh, Syncery.com. You can just go there and take a look at what we're up to. We're also sponsor a newsletter called Data Superheroes because we believe that uh, data is the key to success. And so joining Data Superheroes is pretty straightforward. You can just go to Syncery.com slash DSH. Uh, data for data superhero and you can sign up there and you can see a lot of interviews there with a lot of interesting marketing and sales and uh, success professionals that talk about the impacts of data and metrics and running your business through more clean and effective data also breaking down silos and totally yeah. yeah we we obviously subscribe and always have amazing um guests on it and also just job postings and what and amazing guests for you oh yeah but <laughs> i did an interview but uh, and then also <laughs> <laughs> yeah and some uh you know fun kind of like funny things with your comics too so thank you so much for being on today's episode and for everyone else um thanks for joining and hopefully tune in to the next episode of forward thinking awesome thank you for having me this is charlie so if you liked what you heard hit like on the platform where you watch this also leave a review honestly we would really really appreciate it You can also subscribe where you listen to your podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or even YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to our newsletter, which is packed full of exclusive content, updates for events or courses that we might be doing, all designed to elevate your marketing operations and B2B strategy. See you next time on Forward and Forward It Up.